Hello, welcome back to Wednesdays with Finn. Fair warning, there are a bunch of birds outside my window and I cannot get them to be quiet. So they're just, they're gonna be our guests for this evening. You know, it's, it's, gonna, it's gonna be a great time. Hello, little bird friends. Hi. Today, the birds and I would like to discuss the kings of Israel. <laughs> Finally letting myself go back to the Old Testament. <laughs> Returning to my home domain. Fair warning, this will not be an in-depth study of all the kings. This will be a flyby overview filled with sarcasm and a lot of editorializing. I to Israel. You could not pay me enough money on this planet to make me want to be a ruler of Israel. I'm telling you, man, from the moment that Israel became a nation, it was just this endless cycle of just rolling trash fire because they're like, hey, yo, let's obey. And God's like, awesome, I'm gonna bless you. And then Israel's like, you know what I'm not feeling? Obedience. And then like everything goes wrong and God's like, I done told you this was this was gonna happen. And then Israel's like, ah, why me? Why am I a trash fire? We must look at Israel from two angles as a united trash fire and as a divided trash fire. So at the beginning of our united trash fire cycle, we have King Saul, the first king of Israel. He's an anointed one of the Lord. He's tall, he's handsome, and he's crazier than a bag of cats. Okay, that's, that's not entirely fair because he didn't start out that way. He actually started out as a pretty good leader. And he was like, he was also a man who really, really wanted to please the Lord and go after God's own heart. The problem is, uh, oh, Saul. Saul is a case study in what happens when you place sacrifice over obedience. Like, God doesn't care how much you sacrifice to him. You, like, you're never gonna outrich God, okay? Like, <laughs> he wants you to obey and actually, like, obey him in your heart as opposed to, like, just, you know, like, nominally. The desire to please and honor God and that desire to truly make God's name known and to truly obey him and, and that spirit of true repentance is what makes the difference between King Saul and our next ruler, King David. Never forget, my friends, both Saul and David were anointed by the Lord. The difference is the heart. These birds will not stop. Get out of my window. Next comes David. And technically next was Ishbosheth, but uh to cut a very long story short, um the house of Judah basically uh, sided with David and helped fight fight with him against the rest of like the, the tribes of Israel who were like, "No, we want Saul as our king." And everyone's like, "No, no, 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 no. God anointed David. Let's have David." And then Abner like defected because like there, there was a whole thing. But then he defected and then everyone then like David's like, "Hey, yo, what's up?" Come over here, Abner. And then, like, it's essentially David. David then became king, and Ishbosheth was then. There was a rebellion. Judah sided with David. David won. Fun fact about this rebellion: the lines along which the nation of Israel divided in order to, like, you know, anoint David as opposed to anointing Ishbosheth, actually sets up the lines along which the kingdom would divide after the reign of King Solomon. It's honestly a super cool, super exciting story involving a lot of murder. And if you want to read it, it's in 2 Samuel chapters 2 through 5. But <laughs> I'm not getting into that whole Ishbosheth saga. Seriously, there's a lot of murder. Did I do the Ishbosheth saga? Comment down below if you want to see me do the Ishbosheth saga. In the meantime, David. So we all know that David is the best king of Israel. That's not even up for debate. Like, I will not be taking questions at this time. He is the best king. That's just how it be. So, well, okay, I mean, technically Solomon, but just, we'll get into it. You have David. And he's a great man. He's after God's own heart. He is a brilliant military leader. He's an adulterer. Wait, what? And David didn't exactly get off scot-free. Our big lessons from David are one, don't get complacent because just because you're following God well in the first place does not mean you can't slip. But David also shows us that you can always go back to God, just repent and be able to take constructive criticism from God's prophets because that that's that's not a common thing amongst the kings of Israel, nor is it really a common thing amongst like God's people just in general. Like God, guys, guys, just listen to the prophets. Throwing them into a hole will not make you any less wrong. I'm just gonna tell you right now that if your first reaction to receiving godly accountability is violence and rage, the other person is not the problem here, buddy. Also, you know the difference between King David and King Saul, or you know, one of them? David was not above receiving accountability. Like when Nathan came up to him and he was all like, hey yo, homie, why are you sleeping with somebody else's wife and then killing her husband? David was like, oh snap, I did wrong. Whereas like when Saul received accountability from Samuel, the reaction was not the same. Another lesson we can learn from King David is to be careful what kind of example we set for our children. David had seven wives. His son Solomon had seven friggin' hundred. That's not even counting the 300 concubines. Oh, Solomon. Solomon, like Saul, started out really well. They both wanted to honor God. They both wanted to be godly leaders. They both wanted to be wise, although Solomon specifically asked for wisdom from God, which was, you know, an amazing ask and an amazing gift. He was the wisest creature ever to live on this earth and ever will be, okay? Which is so cool. But then King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter. Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites. They were from the nations which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them because they will surely turn your hearts after their gods. 
Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. He had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines, and his wives led him astray. From Solomon, we learn that you can literally have all the wisdom in the world, but if you surround yourself with the wrong people, you will be led astray. Okay, so seeing as I have reached the breaking of the kingdom into two parts, um, I'm going to do the same and call this video for today. The following two weeks will go thusly. Next week, we will go over the kings of Israel. The week after, we will go over the kings of Judah. Get ready for a wild ride, my friends. I like to say that the entirety of Israel was a trash fire, but honestly, it wasn't that big of a trash fire when the kingdom was united, but when it was divided, <laughs> oh boy. Stay tuned for that. But in the meantime, stay safe, make wise choices, and happy Wednesday.